course, we're going to have one of our regulars. Uh, she is a staple here at Storytelling Vermont, and we always look forward to what she has to share. Please welcome Lisa Cannon. So I feel like I need to start my story tonight with a little bit of a note. When I heard the introduction about the great work that Dismas House does and the content of their work, I kind of froze because my story happens to be this sort of tragic comic take on an experience that I had. And it includes would-be, um, well, let's say this. It includes people who were trying to commit a crime and police who were trying to stop them. And I just want to say that I hope that I don't cause any offense in telling this story. Um, it was a quite amazing experience, and I learned a lot about humanity <laughs> in it. So um, I just want to put that out there. Um, so my work used to take me all over the world. And I had the good fortune of living in South Africa for about five years, not long after uh, apartheid ended and Nelson Mandela became president. And it was just so fascinating because everything was turned upside down, everything. Um, people were relearning the space that they lived in, the neighborhoods that they lived in, how to interact with each other. And I was fortunate enough to meet this wonderful white South African woman named Desiree. Now, her name was spelled like I thought Desiree. She was always quick to point out that, no, it's Desiree. And I was like, OK. And that sort of tells you a lot about who she is. She was just this very exacting, specific, strong woman. But she was also just like so fun. And for my second year living in Johannesburg, which is at the time like the murder capital of the world, um, I got to live with her in her beautiful house, which unlike all the other houses in the neighborhood, had absolutely no walls to the street. Every other house had big high walls enclosing their gardens and their lawns. So right away I thought, this is really cool. And she kind of lived her life uh, very openly, and she dealt with people of all races, people from different countries, people like me coming and going. And it was a beautiful space. There were koi ponds in the front and gardens, and um, she was a masseuse, too. So it was just like the whole package was amazing. <laughs> and I'm grateful to her for that second chance, because... My first living experience in Johannesburg was quite strange. Um, it was kind of hard to even know how to find a place to live because it was a society where you know people stayed within their family. Certain races of people weren't really allowed to literally move anywhere else. And so this notion of someone coming in from the outside and looking for a flat was really kind of foreign to most people. So somehow or another, I heard about what they called a granny flat. Um, it was attached to a rather large house on a small mountain in the middle of the city. And it was actually only a few blocks away from, from Mandela's house. So that was kind of cool. I used to get to go on my walks and go, hey, Madiba, that was his affectionate name. You know, I just sort of, he had big walls around his house. So it's not like I saw him, but I just... <laughs> I would just wave. <laughs> so one day I am in this house and I've got the windows open. It was a nice spring night. I'm playing my music. I don't know what I was doing, maybe even dancing. I, I was alone a lot and I was kind of bored. So all of a sudden I look and I'm startled to see two guns being pointed in the window. Now, luckily, there was a little bit of this sort of fancy iron grill work, so, but still, you know, the, the guns could fit through that. Um, and I sort of startled, and the two men holding the guns said, It's okay, madam. 
we are security. And I said, then why are you pointing the guns at me? I haven't done anything. <laughs> they had a really limited command of English. Their native language was Zulu, and so I heard them talking back and forth. And I always try and assume the best of people, but I start getting really worried when they went around to the front door, which was the only entrance in and out of the flat, and started trying to break the very pathetic little lock. So I, my mind went into, okay, what do I do now? And I closed my bedroom door, which didn't fully close. So I closed it and then I kind of used my body to kind of prop it shut. And I realized there was, that was the only way in and out. So I just felt like kind of a sitting duck. The only thing I could think of to defend myself was an iron. Afterwards, one of my South African friends said, did you at least plug it in? I'm like, no. <laughs> so I'm standing there, sort of crouched on the floor, trying to hold the door shut with the iron in one hand and a phone in the other. And I call the police. And the policeman answers. And I tell him what's going on. And he says, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I said, so can you send someone? No, madam, I'm very sorry. I said, why not? And he said, I would really love to help you, but we only have one car, and the captain has it out right now. So I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so then, luckily, I thought to call Desiree, and man, oh, man, was that the, the right choice? Called her, and I told her what had happened, and she said, oh, for Christ's sake, call him back and tell him I'm going to go pick him up and that they should wait outside. <laughs> so she did. She, you know, all business, get in, you guys, da, da, da. And she pulls up in front of my house. By this time, the, the guys who were right at the window are, I don't know where they are, but they're not right there anymore. So I sort of reopen the window. And I hear her, well, I hear them ringing the bell <laughs> very politely. <laughs> And I hear her saying, for God's sake, you idiots, climb the wall. Nobody's going to come open the door for you. <laughs> and then I hear them sort of talking back and forth. And then I hear her say, one of you stand there and put your hands like this. And the other one, put your foot in and climb over the wall. <laughs> So they do finally get over the wall, and they very tentatively look around. And at that point, we can't really see hiding her hair of the security guys. So, but I felt uneasy staying there. I was the only one on the property. Everybody else was away. It was a holiday. And so Tazira took one look at me and said, go get your stuff. You're coming to live with me. And I was forever grateful to have that second chance. Thank you.